I am fantasy and paranormal romance author Leslie Penelope, and welcome to My Imaginary Friends, a look behind the scenes of an author mapping the worlds in my head and making them a reality. Hello friends, today is Sunday, January 14th, 2024, and this is episode 230 of My Imaginary Friends. I'm Leslie. This week's best thing, I saw the final cover of Daughter of the Merciful Deep, and if you are listening to this in real time, the cover reveal will be this Thursday, January 18th. It will be revealed on the Orbit website, but I'll also be posting it up on my social media and in my newsletter. So if you're not on my newsletter, you can go to lpenelope.com newsletter. You can go to my website to see my social media and make sure you're updated because... It's beautiful, I love the cover, and I'm really excited to have everybody see it. Another cool thing that happened just today, and I would have done the podcast in my costume, but that was a little bit too much. I was invited to this Bridgerton tea by romance novelist Golden Angel. And so me and my friend Inez Johnson, we dressed up. Now I did not dress up in a period appropriate attire. I was looking at Regency dresses and they weren't speaking to me, but I wanted to get like a medieval kind of dress that I could wear to the Renaissance Festival also. So I decided that I was going to be a time traveler and just wear my medieval dress to the Regency Bridgerton tea and it worked out in my mind. It was a lot of fun. Uh, She had lots of food, lots of different kinds of tea. There were a lot of people there. It was like a very, it's one of those things that you put on when you're an extrovert (laughs) and you do. It was at her house and Golden Angel is lovely and so we had a lot of fun there and I was very grateful to be able to go and have that experience. It was just such a cool idea. So there was period appropriate recipes and foods and cucumber sandwiches and scones and marmalade and just all the whole thing. It was it was very, very nice. And there will probably be pictures on my Instagram, so I will link to those in the show notes. In my writing update, I am scheduled to turn in Brutal Fortress tomorrow to the audiobook folks. I do plan to check in with them because I know that the Beastly Kingdom audiobook is very, very much behind. And the only reason I have my release date in March is because I know that they wanted to have a simultaneous audiobook release. But if that's not going to happen, if they continue to be behind, then there's no reason to have that in March. So stay tuned. I will keep everyone updated. Pre-orders are available for Brutal Fortress, book three in the Bliss War series. And also, I got a book bub. This is my first book bub for an indie book. And so if you're not familiar, if you're not an author, uh, you might want to subscribe to BookBub if you're not already. It's an email list full of book discounts. On the author side, when you get a BookBub, which is a BookBub feature deal, they you discount your book, so it will be 99 cents. And this is for Savage City, I should say. This is the first book in the series. Savage City will be 99 cents. It is in the paranormal romance category. It's coming out January 26th is the date of the BookBub. So it's a huge email blast to hundreds of thousands of people on this list. It gets you a lot of discounted sales, and the idea is they would go on and read book two, Beastly Kingdom, and hopefully pre-order book three, Brutal Fortress. They are very expensive, but it's definitely worth it. It's in in theory. I mean, we'll see if it's worth it for me. It seems to be worth it for everybody else for many years. I have had book bubs for Song of Blood and Stone, my traditionally published books. I don't believe that The Monsters We Defy has had one yet. And you have to be chosen. You, I have been rejected many times. And I don't, I'm not very consistent about applying. You can apply for a book bub every 30 days, I believe. And so there are authors who are just every 30 days, they apply for one book or another. And I have been very lax in doing that. I've done it occasionally, but this time was the time. And so I'm really hopeful that having the completed trilogy for The Bliss Wars, sales will pick up and more people will find the series and read it all the way through and hopefully enjoy it. That is the goal. That's what we're doing here. So I'm super excited. I might do a couple of other promos. So promo stacking is the idea where you, when you get one promo, like a book bub, you support that over the course of the next week to 10 days with other promos and other newsletters. They're usually smaller, but it can keep the tail of the sales going on longer. So January 26th is the book bub. I was already participating in the Pharaoh bub, which is from the folks at Fantasy Romance, February, Pharaoh Feb, and they're doing their own version of a big sales event on February 2nd, I think it is. And so, you know, it'll be on sale that whole week. I might do another one or two in between, in you know, between January 6th, 26th and February 2nd to capitalize on that. But yeah, so that's my my big plan for Savage City. 
and I'm excited to see how it goes. I had done some other promos that didn't go super well, and I don't exactly know why, but I had, I think I've updated the blurb since then. I think the cover is really good. I'm not going to change the cover anytime soon. I mean, I just barely revealed the cover for book three. So there's things that you do if your book is not selling well and blurbs, color, uh, covers, maybe titles, maybe the book is bad on the inside. I don't think it's bad on the inside. I think the reviews are good for the people who have read it. And that is what we're going to do and see how it works. And in other writing news, I this week started plotting my new book, which is a paranormal thriller. And I, I so this is a book that I had worked on years ago. And I, I found out exactly how many years ago when I finally opened up the folder and looked at it. I started working on this book 10 years ago in 2013. Those are the dates on the original files for the original idea. Then I worked in it again in 2015 and 2017 and 2020. I would touch it here and there. I have a full draft of this book somewhere that I decided not to read, but I did go back and reread a lot of my notes. And this is actually a book. So if you've been around for a long time, you OGs who have been with me since the beginning will know that I have books in a series called The Eternal Flame, Angel Born, Angel Fall. There was going to be a third book, which was Angel Rise. This book that I'm working on now was meant to be a spinoff of the third book that I never finished and never came out. Was it a spinoff of a spinoff? Because Savage City was originally a spinoff of that third book, too with one character. This book was a spinoff with a character who has been in my mind, in my canon, in my mind for 10 years or more. But, you know, he didn't appear in the new, the published version of Savage City. And I think he was going to be in Savage City. He didn't appear in Angel Rise because Angel Rise never came out because I never finished it. And this book he never appeared in. So that poor character, I don't think we'll ever see the light of day because I'm retooling the idea. I'm coming at it with fresh eyes, a new perspective, and so much energy. I'm so excited about this book, y'all. I don't see any reason not to tell you the title. And I'm if I sell it to a traditional publisher, the title very well might change. But this is the book that is called The Book of Secrets. And that's going to be its working title. And depending on how it goes, maybe the final title. Who knows? We, we'll see what, what happens. But like I said, it's a paranormal thriller. It is. It was going to be modern day. Originally, it was modern day. But I am feeling a lot of energy towards setting it in the 90s, specifically in 1999. And there are a lot of reasons for that. I think the main character is going to be my age, so born in the year that I was born. I graduated from college in 1999. I was 21 years old, and that is going to be her age as well, I think, at the moment. This is all like first week of plotting. But for me to tell a story that in a time period that is my time period, the 90s, like I'm a 90s child, I think it'll just be easier for me to have those touchstones of where was I, what was I doing, what music was I listening to, what clothes was I wearing. But there are other reasons other than that that I want to set it in 1999. Possibly dual timelines and still mapping out the twists and turns. So uh, I wanted to go through a little bit of the process of starting a new book, but starting a new book that I've worked on over the years. Even though I've worked on it a lot, like I said, I'm not rereading the manuscript that I wrote. I don't think that is helpful for me. When I go back to a manuscript for, that I haven't worked on in years and I don't remember exactly what year? I think one year for NaNoWriMo, I did this book, but it's got to be five, six years. Uh, maybe it was 2017. It might have been. That's feeling I could check, but I'm not going to right now. I went back to my notes and I reread. I had this whole outline, I had a synopsis. This book had fallen apart at the end, like so many do. And because if it really was 2017, you know, I was deep, knee deep in Earthsinger Chronicles. I had been under contract with a traditional publisher for many years. So I never really, you know, I would work on it that I had to be drawn away back into my contracted book. And I would write other things, but things like this one that I was having a lot of trouble with and I needed more time to focus on. I just didn't have the time. I wasn't ready to finish writing it. I was trying to do different things with it and it didn't work out. So starting over, fresh start, new slate, but using the work I had done before. So I have a lot of the characters, I have the relationships, I have a lot of the conflicts, I don't have the end, and I don't have all the twists and turns, but I have got, I've got some of the bigger twists, maybe one big twist. So I started a diary uh, for this project, which is, is something I've been doing recently. I have a Google document that at the end of every writing session, I will just jot some notes down, what happened, what I did, what I was thinking, 
It helps to organize my thoughts and to organize my emotions about the project. So much of writing is managing your own emotions about things and the ups and downs and highs and lows. So the first day uh, was January 8th that I worked on this, the first day of my diary for the Book of Secrets. And I was really wondering, should I go through all of this material? I found the folder. I opened up the folder on my hard drive and I saw, not only did I have a folder full of documents, I had an archive folder with more documents from the very first time I had tried to do this. So in my folder naming scheme, when I, you know, everything that needs to be cleared out, I just create a new folder called underscore archive. So it's always at the top and dump everything in there and then start, start fresh. So now I have two archives for this project. Um, but I did, I looked through it, like I said, and a lot of good stuff was there. I realized how much work I'd actually done on this, still needing to start over, but I can use the basics of the old outline. So once I looked at the outline, I decided to start with mind mapping. So I opened up the program Scapel, which I like for mind mapping. I think it's an Apple only program. Uh, and I just did some mind mapping of the themes based on what I was interested in working on, what was coming to me through the outline that I read. I decided to set it in 1999 and that was still a question, but that was what I was leaning towards. And did a little bit of research into Y2K, which I think is going to be a part of this. And and by do research, I meant I looked up Y2K on Wikipedia. That was the extent of the research so far. But it did give me some ideas and started the engines and the warming up the engines. So this is kind of my warm up period. I started looking for comps on Goodreads for the type of book that I think this is. And so looking at paranormal thriller, supernatural suspense, other keywords that I think are being used to describe this kind of story. And I wasn't ex entirely satisfied by the comps that I was finding, but I did make a list of books that I'm going to be reading because I've been reading a few thrillers here and there, but if that's going to be this genre, I need to steep myself in this genre to see what, what people expect, what the genre even is, and how do I make it a Leslie Penelope paranormal thriller slash supernatural suspense without it being horror, because I'm not drawn to like horror. And it's not horror at all. It's not. It's paranormal slash supernatural because people have powers. But I'm not necessarily dealing with ghosts or spirits like that, as far as I know right now. The next step for me was to start my process that I do in the Imaginary World Building course. So I start with the Story Seed Workbook. That is how I take my inspiration, my spark, the seed of the idea, and start to nurture it and have it grow. And so I started this workbook and went through it. It asks you things about your inspiration and then it asks about comps, genre, things like reviews, what reviews might be. You know, there's an exercise where you write down the kinds of reviews you want readers to write about the book when it's done. And that helps you envision what you want the book to be. And I was still having trouble with the comps and having trouble with figuring out where this book sits on the shelf in the marketplace, what are the other books like it. And so I turned to ChatGPT and it was actually really helpful. And I think I'm going to do a totally separate video showing how to use ChatGPT with the Story Seed workbook to begin to flesh out a new story idea or an old story idea that you're starting over again. So I did a couple of days work on that. And then in my mastermind this weekend, or was it last weekend? Uh, I, whatever day it was, I brought it up to my two writer friends and just told them, okay, this is where I am. These are the questions that I have. And we brainstormed some ideas of where it could go. So they've been hearing about the story for years as well. Some of them might have read a version years ago. I know my brother read a version years ago. But yeah, brainstorming it with other people. While I'm still in that early gestating uh, period, and I don't know exactly what the story is. Like, I know what I know. Like, I know the things I need to have in there. But like I said, the end is still a mystery and it could go different ways. And two incredibly accomplished, serious, talented, creative people helping me to brainstorm it was really helpful. It's like I have a page of notes. And then, you know, over the coming weeks, I will take that, continue to refine it, continue to go through the process do my workbooks, start my spreadsheets, do more research, watch more movies, read more thriller books. I have a list, like I said, of thrillers that I'm going to read and I've gotten stuff from the library and I'm really excited because this is something fresh and a little bit different. It's something that is a challenge for me. It's 
new and the idea, everyone was excited about the idea. You know, if I tell them the hook, the pitch, the elevator pitch, everyone's eyes light up. And that's how I know I have something. So I am so excited and have so much energy behind this project and getting started will be so much fun. Although it's daunting because I don't know how I'm going to pull this off. You know, I've been reading some thrillers that have twists just for the sake of twists. Like these twists are not making any sense to me. I'm like, what is happening here? I need to make sure that this is grounded and makes sense and feels good and doesn't leave the reader being like, well, I guess she needed a twist, so she stuck that in there. What, what the hell? That is not the experience I want the reader to have when they read this book. That is what I've been doing and having lots of fun with it. Another important part of the process is filling the well and not just with the research into books that are similar to mine or what I want this book to be, but just all across the board. So, you know, over Christmas, I saw American Fiction and The Color Purple, and I loved both of them. American Fiction is so, so good. I want to see it again. It's not playing in my direct area. I'd have to go a little far afield to watch it again, so I might have to wait till it comes on video, but I adored that movie. Uh, I also read the book The Wishing Game by Meg Shafferty, I think is her name. I'll put the link in the show notes. Really good. I enjoyed that a lot. I didn't think that I would necessarily. Well, like, I, I wanted to read it. The first chapters, I was like, hmm, am I going to keep reading this? And I kept going. And I'm very glad that I did because it was amazing. And then this weekend, I went out to see The Book of Clarence, which is the new book, the new movie by um, James Samuels, who did The Heart of They Fall. And then I watched Saltburn on Amazon Prime. Y'all, I recorded a whole video on both of those on the similarities between those two movies. And yes, there are similarities between Saltburn and The Book of Clarence, and also why I found them creatively inspiring and what writers can take from these two movies. So that should come out this Friday, I think. Uh, check the YouTube feed. If you are an audio-only podcast listener, then either check the YouTube feed or the Footnotes newsletter. I'm going to post it both places. So myimaginaryfriends.net slash footnotes. I literally watched Saltburn last night. I saw the book of Clarence the day before yesterday. And I was up last night and early this morning, just like jotting down notes about, oh my goodness, this is, I was like, I have to do a video about this because I have a lot to say. <laughs> and no one, none of my friends have seen either of these movies. My brother, I did get my brother to watch it. And he, well, he has, I got him to watch Saltburn, which he hated. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say he hated it, but it's a love it or hate it movie. And I fully expect many people to hate it. I told my, I told uh, Cerise and Inez, my two mastermind partners that I loved it. I don't think that either one of them would like it. They probably shouldn't even watch it. But if they do, let me know. It is, it's a lot. It's a lot. But uh, if you don't mind spoilers, if you don't plan to see it, watch the video that's coming out because I had a lot to say about it. <laughs> and finally, I'm going to link to the interview with uh, the writer director, James Samuels, who did the Book of Clarence on The Breakfast Club. I just found that interview incredibly inspiring as a creative person. He is so unique. So he was a musician, he a producer, he had a whole music career before he started making films. And then with the films that he's written and directed, he composed the score, he produces the soundtrack and is a recording artist on the soundtrack along with other people. He does everything. It's really interesting. My favorite uh, filmmaker when I was in college, when I was in film school, was Hal Hartley who also wrote, directed, and composed the scores for his movies. Completely different, <laughs> very, very different style of music and everything. But there's something to be said about controlling the entire process. And one of the reasons why I like writing novels as opposed to making films is I can write novels by myself. <laughs> writing, a, Making a film, I need lots and lots of other people, which is good in and of it, you know, for what it is. But it is very unique and rare to be able to control so much of the process yourself. But also, James Samuels has uh, just energy and a unique perspective. He's incredibly confident about his art without being arrogant or conceited. I don't know many writers who will say and sit here and tell you, this book is like nothing you ever read. You have to read it. It's going to change your life. This book that I wrote is a thing that you actually have to read. No, nobody else has done anything like that. And you, you need it right in your life. Like, I'm giving you this gift of this work that I have created and you need to consume it. That is how he is about his movies. And that is the energy that I want more of us to have. So I sent the interview to my friends. I was like, we need to 
inject this energy into our bloodstreams and figure out a way to authentically talk about our work in this way. Because why else are we doing it? Like, if we didn't think that you should read this book, why did we spend so much time and energy writing it? Like, but so much of a, so many authors and writers are, I'm not going to say it's false humility, but we're consumed with self-doubt and imposter syndrome and this humility that, I think humility is a good quality. Like, I, I respect humility a lot. But also, you need to read what I wrote because I think it's great and I think that it will improve something about your life and give you hours of entertainment and food for thought and all of the rest. So I'm really going to think more and uh, just work on incorporating at least a, a little bit of that energy. I mean, he's got enough to spare, as you can see in this interview. And it was just really, it inspired me. It woke me up. It was like, yeah, why why are more of us talking about what we do this way? Some people are kind of like, oh, I wrote a book. You can read it if you want. And, you know, like I have that about me too. Because I don't want to be pushy and be like salesy. But also... I spent a lot of time and energy and put a lot of myself into it. And I think that it's valuable and I think it deserves to be out there and it deserves to be read. And yeah, there's a way to communicate it that is honest and true and doesn't come off as conceited and arrogant. It comes off as just being like really human and connected. And um, I'm also thinking about, I was in this meditation group on Fridays and the, the meditation was on dreaming. And a question was asked at the beginning before we start meditating. And he asked the question, like, what are your dreams? Do you have dreams for 2024? And I was like, oh, yeah, I have dreams for 2024. And then as I went through the meditation, I was like, wait, do I? Like, I have goals and plans. And I think that dreams are different than goals and plans. I'm not exactly sure how. James Samuel talks about dreaming in this interview also. He says, like, dreams, he is not a fan of, of dreaming per se. His perspective is that dreams are what you do when you're asleep. When you're awake, you make things happen, you take action. There's that, which I respect, but also the idea that if we don't dream big, how do we make anything happen? Yes, there's action, there's steps that you have to take, and there's plans you have to make in the real world when you're awake. But maybe before you do that, you kind of have to dream it. And I feel like I need to give myself permission to have bigger dreams because I'm very practical and I'm very focused on the practicality and I've never focused on the dreaming. And I think that's something I would like to at least bring more into balance. You know, I think I'm good at taking action. I'm good at seeing um, the landscape and sort of um, finding that maybe the possible pitfalls and planning a route around possible pitfalls. I believe in efficiency. I had a post a few weeks or months ago on footnotes about efficiency and creativity and art and pushing back against the notion that art can't be efficient. But also, I think there's a place for efficiency and a place for dreaming. And I've made a lot of space for efficiency. I haven't made a lot of space for the dreaming. And I would like to dream bigger. So that is what I have for you for this week. My goals for the coming week are to continue the plot work. It's going to take a few weeks, more longer, to plot this book to my satisfaction so that I can submit the outline and the first couple of chapters to my publisher and do more promo work, start getting the promo gears rolling for the Brutal Fortress release. I have another video, oh, this is this ChatGPT video that I want to record and maybe put out next week. So I'm trying to do things, really um, break things down into manageable pieces. And I have all these ideas. I have lists and lists of ideas of things I want to do that I have to start actually doing because I haven't been. <laughs> Time for action. I'm awake. I'm going to take action and make them happen. So apply a little bit more organization. Things are falling into place in my mind, which is where they have to be before I can make them happen in real life but yeah i'm i'm having a very energetic day <laughs> but i hope that you have a wonderful week and i will talk to you next time for episode show notes and to sign up for the footnotes newsletter and get the show notes in your inbox go to my imaginary slash footnotes you can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts watch the video episodes on youtube you can email me at podcast at lpenelope.com and rate and review the podcast for good karma. 
My Imaginary Friend is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. For more fantastic podcasts, go to frolic.media slash podcast.